Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Carl Wetterquist, I'm your host. Welcome to the first GEQ Faculty Research Seminar. This is a regular research seminar that has just been approved for the whole semester and we hope to make this an ongoing event at uh, Georgetown University. And it comes at a great time because we're right now just beginning our uh, joint certificate in media and politics with Northwestern University. Um, and we have today a presentation on the media. So this is great. Our presentation today is by, is, is, uh, is uh, called Media Credibility and the Hostile Media Effect, the case of CNN and Al Jazeera. Um, and our presenter held a PhD from Columbia University. He is assistant professor of economics right here at Georgetown University. Um, and last year, he was uh, awarded a one-year fellowship at Princeton University, where he, where he uh, worked on the, on the uh, presentation that he's presenting just today. And uh, he was there for the, uh, all of uh, the last academic year, 2012 to 2013. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Alexis Antonia. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy the food. I'll try to make sure you enjoy the presentation. So the title is Ideologies, Media Branding, and the Hostile Media Effect, Muslim Response to Al Jazeera and CNN Coverage. And what I will do, I will try to explain what each component is and why this kind of exercise makes sense. I have to say this builds on an earlier uh, project that was funded by Qatar National Research Fund with Tara Makarem, but it took shape uh, while I was away at Princeton last year. And, uh, to give you some of the history, a lot of my colleagues there and a lot of my colleagues here and a lot of colleagues in other universities, when they care about international politics, you realize that to have a complete answer, you need to understand the role of media. And I put together a graph just to, to give you this, this idea, since we are launching this uh, very important certificate in media and politics. But if you think about, you know, we care about rising anti-Americanism in the Middle East. We care about the perception of US foreign policy in the Middle East. So there is the public at the top, and there is the you know, US government at the bottom, but they never interact with each other. All the information, or the majority, goes through the media. And then the role of media in politics is very rich, very complex, and very important. So there are different theories. For example, the government may influence media. And this is known as the manufacture of consent theory, that the government is very powerful, they have control of the media, and they use the media to mobilize support for their policies. But it could be the reverse influence. It could be that the media, and this is known as the CNN effect, by showing all the time, you know, uh, breaking news, humanitarian study, stories, they do put pressure on the government to act. And this is the CNN effect, how the media may influence government behavior. But then you go one level up, and then there's the interaction between the media and the public. The media may be biased and they introduce coverage slant, which affects perception and public opinion. But it could be that the media is not biased, and the public perceives bias, and this is where the presentation will be together. And this is no, known as the hostile media effect. And I will, again, define it in two minutes, but it's the idea that some story is not biased, but for some reason we perceive bias, and we perceive negative bias. So it's a very, very complicated relation between international politics and media, and, what, and this is why I'm, you know, I'm excited about the, the launch of this uh, certificate. Let me introduce the topic. Are media biased or is bias a matter of perception? It could be both. So sometimes we are biased against the media and we find bias in coverage, but sometimes the, the media is biased. And this is an important question because these are times when the public is losing trust to the media. We hear stories about CNN, we hear stories about Al Jazeera coverage, we hear about every channel. And when these media go global, the implications of mistrust or misperception about their recovery becomes global, become more important. So in this paper, 
what I will do, I will test how ideologies, and I will be very specific, how being Muslim may affect viewers' perception. And I will also test whether media credibility may affect viewers' perception. And I will do it in a very specific setting. Let me give you an outline of uh, the presentation that I will go over in the next 45 minutes. I will spend some time to talk about the hostile media effects since we all come from different backgrounds. And this will explain why we may think that ideologies affect perception, why it may be interesting to, to run the experiment that I ran, and I will present you the results next, and also how do you design such an experiment? What are the things you have to be careful about? Then I will describe the experiment, and once I do that, I will go over the analysis, and then we can have a discussion. And my colleague Carl will, will moderate uh, the questions. Now, if you, if you want to ask any clarification along the way, please do so, but keep, uh, keep your comments very, very concise. The hostile media effect is the process by which individuals perceive neutral information to be biased against them. So partisan groups, they get exposed to information that any uh, random observer would find to be neutral, and they perceive negative bias when they assess that information. This became known as a hostile media effect. And the first study that was a, a very important study in media was in 1985 by Valos, Leper, and Ross. And what they did, they took a group of Israeli students and a group of Palestinian students, and they had them view some clips covering the 1982 massacre of uh, refugees in Lebanon by Israeli soldiers. Now, the researchers, they were very careful to select clips that they thought were not biased in either direction. So they, they, they had the students on both sides view the clips, and then they asked them, do you find any bias in coverage? And what they found out is that both groups, both the Israelis and the Palestinians, they found that the clips were biased against them. So the Israelis thought that the clips were biased against Israeli. The Palestinians thought that the clip was biased against Palestinian. And this became known as a hostile media effect. And what is interesting is that the the people who watched the clips, they were not really concerned that this perceived bias was going to affect their views, but they were very worried that this perceived bias was going to affect public opinion. And then this study was replicated again with Israeli and Palestinians. It was refined by Ginner, Sorola, and Saigen, and Perloff. People have done it in different settings. So for example, Albert Gunther and his colleagues, they looked at the UPS strike and they, they had the managers look at some newspaper coverage and they had the employees look at newspaper coverage. And again, both groups perceived negative bias in coverage. They've done it with soccer teams when the two teams play and they, they interviewed the fans of each side. They've done it with lab research using primates with genetically modified organisms. So they took scientists promoting GMOs and the other group was people protesting GMOs, and they had them look at some assessment, and again, both groups, they perceived negative bias. This is a hostile media effect. Now, there is some restriction in this experiment, so in the discussion I will tell you where I think um, there is some limitation in these studies. Now, it's, it's important to, to understand why could it be the case that we perceive negative bias when there is no bias? And researchers try to explain it. So in the, in the beginning, they thought it has something to do with the way our brain processes information. It's about judgment heuristics. And they came up with three plausible stories. One is selective categorization. And let me use a diagram by Albert Gunther and his colleagues to to show you how it works. Let us say we have a story, and this story has nine arguments. Three of them are against our view, three of them are neutral, most people would find neutral, and three of them 
are pro our view, in our favor. And then we get exposed to this information. One of the reasons why we may perceive coverage bias, negative bias, is because when we classify them into against neutral and positive, we tend to put more things in the category that, you know, the arguments that are against us. And this is represented by the lower diagram. So instead of having three arguments again, now we have five. And instead of one neutral, actually we have six. We take even from the positive. So it's how we classify things. We have a range of arguments that we are willing to accept, and we tend to narrow this down. Another reason why we may perceive negative bias is because of selective recall. We get exposed to a story, but we tend to always remember the things we didn't like and not the things we liked. So when people were asked, what are the arguments you recall, they were more likely to recall the, bad ar the arguments against them than the arguments in their favor. And finally, it may be a story of different standards. So this is not about miscategorizing the arguments. It may not be about not recalling some of the arguments. So in this case, you recall the, the arguments against you, you recall the neutral, and you recall the arguments in your favor. But you just feel that the arguments in your favor are so strong, and the arguments against you are not that strong. And just by putting them in the same debate, the reporter introduces negative bias, bias against you. Because the other arguments are not that important, and they, we give them a lot of weight. So they've been testing that, and it seems that selective recall is probably the main reason. Now, who is more prone to this hostile media effect? Again, research is telling us that partisan groups, high involvement groups, people with strong views, are more likely to perceive bias. If I show you a clip and you really don't care, you will probably will not perceive bias. But if you have very strong opinions about something, you, you are more likely to perceive this bias. And, uh, and you, you, know, you resist, you offer greater resistance to persuasion, and after you watch this story, you become uh, more polarized. And then you tend to discredit the message or the messenger. Very recently, Research has focused on the, on the media source. No, and they said, maybe it's not the way we process information. Maybe it has nothing to do with the, the information itself. It may have to do with the messenger, with the news story. So then the second explanation, and there hasn't been much work on that, is to look at media characteristics, the audience demographic, and general skepticism towards the media as a mechanism by which uh, our trust in a story is affected. And this goes back to the attribution theory, which is the idea that we try to get cues, we try to get information from the reporter, from the channel, in order to assess a story. So there's a story about Syria, and it comes from Al Jazeera, and depending where you stand, you say, oh, it's Al Jazeera, it will not be right, or it's Al Jazeera, it will be great. There is a story about you know, US policy, and it comes from CNN. You try to find cues, oh, it comes from CNN, it's not right. So it's not really about the story, but it's about media credibility. And our, this study will try to address both. The shortcoming of the literature is that media credibility has not been taken into account much. Now, you can imagine why misperception matters, and there are different categories I list here. It affects perceived public opinion. It, under, it reinforces a, a growing uh, cynicism and disaffection from politics. It undercuts the potential for news to inform public opinion. If you don't trust them anymore, if they lose their credibility, then they cannot do their job. It contributes to feeling of political and social alienation. You know, people are out to get you. They never report your story right. And then, of course, that may change your behavior in a bad way. And it's also very important for advocacy groups then they may engage in a certain behavior because they think there is bias against them. Okay. So this is just the introduction of the hostile media effect. This idea that people with strong views may perceive neutral and biased stories to be biased against them. And this is what I take. And in this experiment that I present to you today, 
I want to test how involvement, and in this case being Muslim, may affect assessment of coverage on very specific topics. Now, why do I care about this? Because if we think of rising anti-Americanism or perceptions of US foreign policy, one can say, well, this, these policies really affect people in the Middle East. And for the most part, they are Muslims. So they will be very sensitive to these policies. So, and maybe they are just too sensitive. And the reason why there is this anti-Americanism and this um, skepticism towards the policy is not uh, the policies themselves. It's just there is this hostile media effect. People do perceive negative bias when there is no bias. So I want to test that in a very specific setting. I also want to test how media credibility may affect misperception of bias. And that is why I will have Al Jazeera and CNN, and I will tell you how I do it. So the experiment, of course, I will ask participants to evaluate a neutral story, and I will show you the story, on a very controversial topic. Why controversial? Because I want to have high involvement. I want strong views. In a way, it will make it easier for me to find this uh, negative bias, perception of negative bias. And the story I will choose, and again, I will elaborate on this, relates to the controversy uh, around the publication of 12 cartoons in 2006 depicting the Prophet Muhammad by a Danish newspaper, which resulted in a call for boycott and violent protests in many, many countries. So there is a study, an experiment in Qatar that has a survey, a news clip, and one more component that, that is sort of the, the important element of this study. Okay, let me explain what the survey is. The survey has uh, the short clip in five modules, five components. The first component, we collect information about people's background. In the second component, in the second module, we ask them how familiar they are with this controversy, just to get a sense. And this is important, I will explain why. And then how they feel about the, the boycott, about the publication of the cartoons, and so on. Then we, we show them the clip, and we have them evaluate the clip. And then we collect their, their views on Al Jazeera and on CNN. So background characteristics, age, income, gender, religion, everything you think of. And of course, religion is what, how we will create the involvement group, if you are Muslim or non-Muslim. Then how aware they are of the boycott controversy. So I am aware, I sympathize with the Danish, I sympathize with the Muslims, I support, support freedom of speech, I support respect for religion, and I support the 2006 calls for boycott against Danish products. Now, the answer to the last question will also help us create the involvement groups. One way we'll do it is based on religion, Muslims versus non-Muslims, the other way we'll do it is whether they support the boycott and whether they don't support. So if you are Muslim, more likely you are going to support the boycott, but also a lot of Christians supported the boycott. And we do this for robustness, just to see if the results change. Then I, I show the clip. And then I'll show you the clip in a minute. Now we want to randomize the experiment. So we want have the people to take the Al Jazeera survey and have the people to take the CNN survey. All right, so let me show you the, the clip. The search for truth can take you all over the world. There's been a lot of speculation about where the Russian troops are. Well, here they are. There is no map. But you can find a guide here. We give you a quick update on the breaking news that we're following. We're going out on a joint patrol now. So the truth may be elusive. But the search is always an adventure. Let's go. We begin our journey here in the forest of Central Africa. A small traditional town in central Sweden but it's changing, and it's now at the center of a very modern row. The local paper, its editor with a price on his head from Al-Qaeda in Iraq, 
he published a cartoon of the face of the Prophet Muhammad on the body of a dog. He says he had to stand up for free speech. I have no, no need to uh, picture Muhammad as a dog, and I have no need to, to offend Muslims, but I really have a need as a publisher to fight for the right for artists to express themselves. That is my, my goal. Local Muslims are upset. In demonstrations, they've demanded an apology. One of the leaders of the protests is a Shiite imam from Iraq, now settled in Sweden. It's good to have freedom of speech, but it doesn't mean you should take advantage of it and insult people. How am I meant to feel if you show the Prophet and in this way many people are upset? Here on Sweden's south coast, this strange wooden sculpture is the work of just one man. He carried thousands and thousands of pieces of wood down to the seashore. For 25 years, he's fought a legal battle to prevent its demolition, so he's not adverse to controversy. But now he finds himself at the center of another row, because he is the artist of the cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. His name is Lash Vilks. He drew three cartoons of Muhammad's head on the body of a dog, and he too has received Al-Qaeda death threats. But this maverick artist likes to provoke. If you want to have a discussion, you must bring in a hot potato, because otherwise no one wants to, to, to discuss things. Now there is something to, to blame. This insult is not personal. It's not against them. It's a principal question of how you look upon re religions. So um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, things could be constructive. Sweden's Muslims ending the daily Ramadan fast. They condemn the Al-Qaeda death threats, but they're also confused and offended. The cartoons have exposed a gulf in values between a largely secular, liberal society and the migrants who have recently arrived in its midst. So this was a clip. Yes. And I had to choose what I thought was a neutral clip. Now, there is a twist. This was not a CNN clip. It, this was an Al Jazeera clip. And what we did, we randomized the experiment. So we had some people, we told them, you take the Al Jazeera survey. And they saw, they saw the Al Jazeera clip with the Al Jazeera logo at the bottom. For other people, we had them take the CNN survey, and they saw this clip. We took out the Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera logo, and then we put uh, CNN opening uh, graphics, and then the clip. We couldn't put the CNN logo because of legal issues, but this is how we randomized it. And to make sure that we randomly assigned people into bins, we told them, if you are born on an even date, you take the Al Jazeera. If you are born on an odd date, you take the CNN. And then we can test whether this randomization was successful. So they, they watch the clip. Then they have to answer if the clip was interesting. Uh, the two questions we care is whether the reporter tried to give an unbiased report. This is how we can assess uh, perception of coverage bias. But we also ask them whether Muslims would find this clip bias. So their perception of the perception of the others. And then those who took the Al Jazeera survey and they thought they've seen the Al Jazeera clip and it was an Al Jazeera clip, then they had to comment on Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is my main source of information. Al Jazeera is biased against the West. Al Jazeera is biased against Muslims. Al Jazeera is unbiased. The West thinks that Al Jazeera is biased. Muslims think that Al Jazeera is biased. And it would be better off without Al Jazeera. And then we had them do the same thing for CNN. Now, if you had seen the CNN clip and you have taken the CNN survey, after the click, you would have to answer the CNN questions and then the Al Jazeera. Because we wanted people to really think they were watching either the Al Jazeera or the CNN. This is what enables us to see whether media credibility affects perception and when it is interacting, interacted with uh, involvement, whether it has an effect. And then the answer was from a scale one to five. 
strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree and strongly agree. And we assign values again from one to five so that we, will, we could analyze the responses. Now, why, that, why did I choose the topic? I chose a topic that would be very sensitive for Muslims, but non, not necessarily for non-Muslims. And I think this is important. In all the studies on the hostile media effect, the kind of experiments they have done is between a group that supports something and a group that opposes that something. So Israel and Palestine, soccer fans of two teams that play with each other, GMOs, UPS strike. But I think for the kind of issues we carry international politics and international relations, more, most often we find cases where this, this issue is very sensitive for one part of the population, but it doesn't mean that the rest will also be sensitive. It's not a zero-sum game. So it's a very big controversy, so it would, be, it would make it more likely for me to find the hostile media effect on Muslims. I don't worry about endogeneity, so I don't worry about the idea that Muslims are more aware of the hostile media effect, the boycott, and this is something that happened yesterday, so they've been thinking more about it, and because they have been thinking more about it than non-Muslims, that may affect how they answer. This was done, the survey was done in 2010, this came from 2006, four years went by, I don't worry about uh, that. They cannot identify the reporter, and it's not that they've been thinking about this every day. And it's easier for me to identify the involvement group. It's easier for me to identify who has strong views about the uh, controversy. I will use religion, and I will use the answer to the question, do you support the boycott or not? So I control for prior knowledge, involvement, and skeptical disposition on media source. Again, I ask them. Ma CNN is biased against Muslims. So that's how I know that somebody thinks that CNN is biased before, you know. Now this is a, just to show you in 2006 when the publication uh, of the cartoons happened, there was a call for boycotting Danish products in the region. It started from the Friday prayers on January 26 in Saudi Arabia. And actually the, I take this from a different paper I have, but what happened overnight sales of cheese product in Saudi Arabia, Danish cheese products went from 17% uh, that the Danish firms had to zero overnight. That's probably the most striking example of a boycott that I have seen. So this is, this is important for, uh, for the region, and this is important for Muslims. I talked about the deception. So I, we removed the Al Jazeera logo, we added the CNN, and that way we're able to interact involvement with skeptical disposition on media source. Now, maybe some of you recognize your faces. The way we collected responses was by posting the surveys online on SurveyMonkey. We also advertised it on Qatar Living, but we also visited malls. We went to Village, and this is a picture of, uh, of a team from uh, volunteers from Georgetown going to Villagian. And this was, you know, that was a big thing, you know, that was in 2010. We went there, we had banners, Georgetown University Qatar research, we had a table, we had six teams of two people each with, uh, with laptop and mobile Wi-Fi going around asking people to participate. And, you know, people were shocked that um, they didn't know what research is, they didn't know, you know, that Georgetown does other things than teaching, but it was a positive, I think, shock. It was a nice, nice interaction with people. And we would just randomly stop people and ask them to take the survey. Before I show you any results, I have to do a couple of things. Remember, I have two groups, the group of people that watch the CNN survey, and the clip, and the group of people that watch the Al Jazeera clip. And I want to see if there are any differences in their responses, in their behavior. Well, I have to make sure that these two groups are homogeneous. So for example, if for all the female population went in one group and all the male in the other group, that may affect my, the responses and it may have nothing to do with Al Jazeera versus CNN. So I want to show that they are homogeneous in background characteristics. Now, these are you know, too small to read. You, you have the paper though, and what we find is that the two groups are identical. So the randomization was successful. 
and we can look at education, we can look at other variables. But it's not enough to show that they're homogeneous in background. So I have the same share of women in each group, the same share of uh, education, distribution, age, and so on. I have to show that in each group, the people have the same views about the boycott. Because if they have different views, if for some reason I got people with stronger views in one group, that may affect the results and it may not have anything to do with Al Jazeera or CNN. So I have questions. I ask them, are you aware of the cartoons controversy? And the average answer of 4.3 means four is agree, five is strongly agree. So they, they agree with the statement. I can go down the list. And, uh, and I get the same responses. So the main point is that the people in each group are identical in background characteristics, and they are also identical in their perception. If I find any difference in their responses, it has to do with, with the clip and media branding. The next step, I need to control, to co uh, construct the involvement groups. Remember, the hostile media effect is more likely to be observed on people with strong views, high involvement. So I go back in the literature, and what does the literature say about involvement? Well, one way to do it is through group membership. So if you care about abortions, for example, you may think that Catholics have more important views than people who like soccer. That's how you do it, group membership. So I will use that definition, and I will use Muslims versus non-Muslims, or Christians. It doesn't really change much. But sometimes the literature advocates for using extremity of attitude toward an issue. So for robustness, I will take the people that support the boycott and compare their answers to the people that don't support the boycott. And that would be the second involvement group. Let me now show you some, some data. In the question, I am aware of the cartoons controversy in 2006, I summarized the average response of Muslims and Christians. And the average response is 4.2 and 4. No statistically different. And remember, four means I agree with the statement. So everybody is aware of the uh, cartoons controversy. When you look at support for freedom of speech, same. Support, respect for religion, the same. Where you find a difference between Muslims and non-Muslims is when you ask them if they sympathize with the Danish publishers. And of course, Muslims don't, but more Christians will sympathize. And also when you ask them, do you support the boycott? That shows me that the, the construction of the involvement groups is successful. They, the, both groups are very familiar with this, uh, with this debate. Both groups support freedom of speech, but they have different views on, on whether they support the boycott and whether they support the Danish publishers. And I can do the same thing with the second involvement, the people that do not support the boycott versus the people that support the boycott. Okay, so now I have my two involvement groups. I can just start the analysis. So, the first hypothesis. Since the hostile media effect literature says that people with strong views will perceive negative bias or neutral stories, my first hypothesis is that Muslims and supporters of the boycott perceive the coverage to be biased against them. Despite of whether you've seen Al Jazeera or CNN, this is coverage, which I think is neutral, um, on a very sensitive to them issue. Based on the hostile media effect, they should perceive negative bias. So now I don't look about Al Jazeera and CNN, I put everybody combined. And what I can do, I can just summarize the answers between all the group. So three is neither agree nor disagree, four is agree, uh, agree with the statement. So when I ask, the reporter tried to give an unbiased report. The average answer is between neither agree nor disagree and agree for the whole sample. When I break the sample into Muslims or non-Muslims or people that support the boycott or do not support the boycott, 
There is no difference. It is not statistically different, the, the answers. 3.5 and 3.4, and actually, Muslims are more likely to find than that the reporter tried to give an unbiased report. But they give you the same answer. I can check the answer to the question, Muslims would find this clip biased, and now it's the Christians that are more likely to think that Muslims would find the coverage biased. So there is no hostile effect there. I don't find that being Muslim or supporting the boycott will make you perceive negative bias. Now, this is not very formal, so I can formalize it a little bit by controlling for education, by controlling for gender, by controlling for age. And the way we do this, we, we run a regression. This is a probit regression that tells you what is the probability to agree with a statement given all these uh, characteristics. So in the first column, I want to find the probability that you will agree with a statement the reporter tried to give an unbiased report. What, what matters is the coefficients that have stars next to them. These are the statistically significant variables. And what you find is that being Muslim doesn't affect the answer you give on this question. So when you ask them, you know, did the reporter try to give an unbiased report, being Muslim doesn't affect your answer. No hostile media effect. When uh, you do the same thing, but you look at the answer to the question, Muslims would find this clip biased. Now being Muslim matters. But it matters the opposite way. So if you are Muslim, you are less likely to agree with the statement that Muslims would find this clip biased. So what do I conclude? And again, I can do the same thing for the people that support the boycott. So what I conclude is that I reject the hypothesis that Muslims would perceive negative bias just because this is you know, a very important to them topic. So they are not that sensitive. Okay, so the second hypothesis is that media credibility matters. If that is the case, then the second hypothesis I'm testing is that the CNN clip receives a less favorable assessment by Muslims and supporters of the boycott. So the, the Muslims would, are more favorable to Al Jazeera than CNN. So I will test this. The one thing I can do is, remember I have two groups and I have Muslims in each group. In one group they watch the Al Jazeera and in the other group they watch the CNN clip. So I go to Muslims in each group and I say, what was your average answer to the question the report tried to give an unbiased report and it was 3.5 between neither agree and agree. I go to the next room which is the people that, that watch the CNN clip and I say what is your average answer? It is the same. It is not 3.4. It is not statistically different. I do the same thing for the other question. No difference. I do this for Christians. I do this for non-Muslims. So bigger group, no difference. Opponents of the boycott, supporters for the boycott. None of these differences are statistically significant. I can run the probit regressions and I've run them, nothing matters. So there is no difference in response uh, whether you watch the CNN or whether you watch the Al Jazeera. And remember, I chose a, a, a group that has very, very strong views and I took a subject that's very controversial to these people and I failed to find any evidence. So the last thing I'm going to do is to say, okay, we reject the first two hypotheses, but why should it matter if you think it comes from CNN or Al Jazeera if ex ante, if before you had no bias against these two channels? It shouldn't matter. But it should matter for the people that ex ante, they thought that CNN was biased. The people that thought Al Jazeera was biased. So for these people, maybe it will matter. So, and this is what I will test. So hypothesis three, which is the last hypothesis, is that skeptical disposition on media sources affects perceptions of coverage slant. How am I going to capture that? I want to test, I want to look at the answer to the statement the reporter tried to give an unbiased report. So how do I identify the people that are biased? Well, I ask them, CNN is biased against Muslims, and some of them agree with this statement, some of them disagree. 
So the people that agree with this statement are the people that ex ante are biased. So I want to see how these people are affected. Let me, let me show you the results and explain what I do here. To, to simplify things, let's say all of you have been exposed to the Al Jazeera clip. This is the Al Jazeera room. And there is another room next to us, which is the people that watch the CNN clip. So in the first recreation, what I will do, I will go to this, to this room, the CNN, sorry, let's say we're the CNN room. And I will say, how many of you think that CNN is biased against Muslims? And it's this half of the room. And this half don't think that CNN is biased against Muslims. And then I will check how your answers differ. You are the people that ex ante you think that CNN is biased. So are you more likely to find coverage biased? So let's look at the first column. What is the response to the statement the report tried to give an unbiased report? And let's look at the, the dummy variable, CNN bias. So this is for the people that think that CNN is biased. So this side of the room. If ex ante, if a priori you thought that CNN is biased, you are more likely to disagree with this statement, with the statement that the report tried to give an unbiased report. And you are more likely to agree with the statement that Muslims would find this biased. So now we, we have perception of negative uh, bias, but it's only for the people that ex ante they, they thought CNN was biased. What is interesting, if you are Muslim and you thought that before you know, CNN was biased, this effect is weaker because what I do, I have to uh, combine, I need to add up the coefficients of CNN bias plus CNN bias and Muslim. So in plain English, if ex ante you thought that CNN was biased, you are more likely to perceive negative coverage biased, but this effect was stronger for non-Muslims, not for Muslims. Actually, in the second column, it kind of washes out, plus 0.5 minus 0.5. So it is skeptical disposition on media that seems to create that and not people's ideologies. I can, for robustness, I can do the following exercise. This is the CNN room. I say, how many of you think that CNN is biased and it's this part of the room? I tell the rest of you, go home, that's it. I go to the Al Jazeera room and I say, how many of you think that CNN is biased? And some people raise their hand, I say, stay. So now I'm comparing the answers of all the people that think that CNN is biased, those in the CNN room and those in the Al Jazeera. And what you find is that if you if you think CNN is biased and you are in the CNN room, so you thought that the clip was the CNN clip, you are less likely to agree with the statement that the reporter tried to give an unbiased report. And you are more likely to agree with the statement that Muslims would find this clip biased. So, the same story. And being Muslim means that the effect is weaker. So again, the people that ex ante thought that CNN is biased are more likely to perceive negative bias. But this doesn't seem to have, anything, to have anything to do with religion. Actually, for Muslims, this is much weaker. And remember, I chose a very controversial topic to find the opposite, and I failed to find it. And this is a big survey. We had 582 people. This is a large sample size for this survey. So let me take two more minutes to conclude just to show a couple more results that I find interesting. So the, I failed to find that uh, the hostile media effect matters. I failed to find that media credibility matters, CNN versus Al Jazeera. It only matters for the people who are skeptical, disposed towards the media. But this effect is weaker for Muslims. Now, I had one, one question which says, CNN is biased against Muslims. And when I look at the response that Muslims gave me in this answer, 45% of the Muslims responded that CNN is biased against Muslims. When I ask the same people, Muslims think that CNN is biased, 69% of Muslims responded that 
Muslims think that CNN is biased, even though only 45% thought of it. This, this is called pluralistic ignorance. So we, we tend to think too much about the others. The same thing for uh, non-Muslims. Only 20% of them think that uh, CNN is biased against Muslims, but when you ask them, Muslims think that CNN is biased, even though we know 45% of the Muslims find it biased, 64% of them think that Muslims consider CNN to be biased, and we can do. And finally, one, one place where I found difference in assessment of coverage slant, and that of course may be an artifact of the study or it, it needs to be explored further. When I look at the response to the statement, the reporter tried to give an unbiased response and I took people that graduated from a segregated university, and this is Qatar. So if these people thought it came from Al Jazeera, the average response to the statement was four. So I agree with the statement. But when people who graduated from a segregated university thought it came from CNN, the average response was below neither agree nor disagree. And that was statistically different. It could be small sample size, but I think that is something that deserves further uh, exploration. All right. So let me summarize um, what, what we found so far. We find no evidence that Muslims are more likely to assess coverage of the controversial topic to be biased against them. There's no evidence that Muslims were more likely to favor the Al Jazeera coverage versus that of CNN. But we did find some evidence or strong evidence that skeptical disposition on media source, the ex-ante beliefs, affect perception of coverage bias. Now this effect is stronger for non-Muslims. So I think this is important because we cannot dismiss concern about, let's say, US foreign policy, about rising anti-Americanism and say, it's just that Muslims are too sensitive because these things affect them and they are too sensitive. There is something else behind it. Also, it's very important to understand how these ex-ante beliefs of bias are shaped in the first place. Okay. So that's all I have to say. Thank you.